Hey there entrepreneurs, my name is Sushant and welcome to Trip Talks. This is a show where I interview successful e-commerce entrepreneurs, business executives and thought leaders and ask them questions about their business story and also dive deep into some of the strategies and tactics that they have used to start and grow their businesses. And today I'm really excited to welcome Ronnie Teja to the show. Ronnie is the founder and CEO of Brandzio Watches. Ronnie started Brandzio with an inspiration to provide men and women quality watches for a good price with the best service possible. And today I'm going to ask Ronnie a few questions about his entrepreneur journey and some of the strategies and tactics that he has used to start and grow his business. So Ronnie, thank you so much for joining me today at Trip Talk. Really, really appreciate your time and looking forward to talking to you. Oh, thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. I'm looking forward to it. So was that a good introduction? Is that how you would describe your brand as well? That, you know, it's uh, you're providing men and women quality watches for a good price with the best service possible? Or do you have a different way of Look, describing let's, it? Let's get back to our Indian roots here, man. I'm a value for money guy, right? Okay. <laughs> the idea the idea behind this 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 brand was essentially to, to give the, the best amount of quality but, uh, for the lowest price possible, right? So sort of that mentality was if 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 you're looking for something that's about eighty to hundred dollars, sit on your wrist. It's a quartz watch, and if it provides the value that it needs to be providing uh, for the least cost possible, that was basically the uh, the thought process behind this. Okay, so and and you were mentioning a little bit before we started recording that you kind of got your start in the entrepreneurial journey through this project, right? Starting this yeah, project. This, this was my first brand, man. This this was it. This my it's my first love. It's my only love. <laughs> so what can you share a little bit about your story like what were you doing before this and how did you come to entrepreneurship and what really motivated you to start like a watch uh brand well my 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 life is sort of a roller coaster man uh in in, in a few things so i'm i'm born in, i was born in india i mean i guess i'm born indian unfortunately as you know our country does not allow two citizenships so so i call yeah. myself a canadian now but what's yeah. my passport so, or an Indo-Canadian, as we are fondly called, or like to be called. Uh, my family, uh, born in Jalanda, uh, grew up in India, moved to the UK to do my master's. And then I, my family immigrated to Canada in 2007, 2008. And the first job that I had when I got off the plane, I think I got off, got off the plane on the 13th of uh, May. And mm. on the 14th of May, I had a job lined up. My first job, mm. believe it or not, was uh, going to pick blueberries. Hmm. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, we had a family of four. We'd moved into a rented basement, somebody's rented basement for, I think, $500 a month. Okay. And it was pretty hard, you know, coming from like a decent, like a nice middle class uh, background in, in India. And then you, all of a sudden you go to Canada and you're like, oh, shit. Hmm. You know, we're poor. And whoa, so what, what does that essentially mean? And it was kind of hard for the first six to eight months because, you know, uh, first of all, I'd never done uh, labor. Hmm. Uh, if you if you looked up my resume till then there was nothing but said oh uh, a labor job or you know I mean to be to be really frank with you I hadn't even mowed a lawn right I mean you have mm. people who do that in India because labor is quite cheap yeah um so yeah that that's where I got started and then you know every morning I used to go out get up at what 4 35 a.m and I used to get picked up in this like you know this van with all these old immigrant families old old uncles and aunties you know uh, mm. people's grandparents and they used to go do this as a side hustle so I used to go and do the same, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to to share with you that I'm not a good blueberry picker. So <laughs> these guys used to make about $150 a day, and I used to make about 50 bucks a day. Hmm. But it was a very humbling experience because it told me it taught me what not what I didn't want to do. Hmm. Right. So what I didn't want to do was uh, do these kind of things. Although money looked really good, uh, I don't. Hmm. I mean, um, it wasn't necessarily where my passion my passion was. You know. Hmm. Uh, then I came across, uh, I think Larry Kim's blog, uh, Larry Kim's blog back in the day, PPC, uh, was it PPC Hero or was it, uh, another one? Oh, WordStream. WordStream okay. is where I learned Google Ads from. Okay. And then I applied for my first job working at HPC, got in there. Uh, my second job was at Best Buy where I learned about retail, which hmm. is phenomenal. Uh, I love, I love, I love Best Buy. I love Best Buy because... I was working 10 to 12 hours. It's a good washing machine, but it was a good washing machine in the sense that it taught me retail. Mm. More so than retail, it taught me ETL because I was I was Best Buy's Best Buy had a brand back then in Canada called Feature Shop. And I used to be yep. a point, point guy for Feature Shop in Canada. So I used to handle all the media buying. So it was one guy with a $5 million budget managing okay. all the media buying, basically which went traffic, Facebook ads, display ads, 
uh, Google ads, social ads, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, um, my, my 10,000 hours, I'd say half of my 10,000 hours, 5,000 hours were done at Best Buy over two years, which was mm -hmm. really interesting, right? And I loved, and, and to be, to be rather frank, I kind of like a very fast paced environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really was what I, what I wanted. But then kind of, you know, you kind of look at how much money you're making other people and you kind of have a look at yourself and you said, you know, mm -hmm. I, I owe myself a chance to sort of, uh, take, take a crack at something, mm -hmm. uh, what I wanted to start, well, I didn't know. Number two, I tried to open an ad agency, failed it miserably. Hmm. Uh, then I read somewhere that you know uh, the margins on quartz watches are about seventy five percent. So that you know piqued my interest. Hmm. I'm like, I know online marketing. Uh, I know that I like my that I like money, hmm. but I don't know how to connect. You know how do you connect hmm. to what's the simulation? Hmm. So then I started researching as to where in the world are watches made. And mm -hmm. where in the world, particularly a quartz watch is made. So quartz watches are, are made in Shenzhen, in China. Okay. And they have a really big event once a year in in uh, Guangzhou. Uh, mm -hmm. in Guang no, not Guangzhou. In, in Hong Kong, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Guangzhou is the canton fair. And I ended up there for a week. I caught a one-way flight, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, whatever happens, we'll see how this goes. But had about like five thousand dollars in my pocket, and I said, "Okay, let's check it out." So I didn't even have startup capital to be, to be honest with you. Mm. Uh, one way flight was about six hundred bucks. Uh, <laughs> landed there, called a friend, uh, you know. So why, why, why one way flight? Like you didn't have plans to come back? <laughs> no, it was more like I'll, I, they, you have to, you have to burn some bridges, man. You have to have that uh, commitment and dedication to saying, "Okay, look, I don't want to come back till the time I have something, something solid in hand." Okay. So. Mm, and I kind of ended up at this clock fair, watching the Hong Kong watching clock fair. And every day in the morning, hmm. I would wake up at like 7, 8 a.m. And then it's about seven floors. And I would go from one end of the one end of the floor all the way, all seven floors. And at 6 p.m., I'd go out, meet a couple of people who I'd met, and then go out and discuss notes and all that. So I was basically the guy who was the dumbest guy on the table trying to learn from the smartest guys at the table, right? Who knew hmm. how to do this. Right? Back then, there was guys at DW, there was guys at Movement Watches, there was all these you know, guys mm. who are out in the, in the, in the industry mm. on day seven, which is the last day, this, this guy approaches me, he says, do you know much about watches? I said, I have zero clue how watches are made. He mm. says, do you know, do you want to see how watches are made? I said, yeah, I'd love that. So he invited mm. me to his factory, this gentleman. And, uh, and I proceeded to stay with him for a couple of weeks and every day he would wake up at 5 a.m. And he would take me to the factory and I would spend a day at the factory with him. I would look at how watches are made in and out every day. And at the end, uh, I basically asked him for a loan. Hmm. I said, would you be willing to give, take a chance on me and give me like some sort of a production loan if possible? Hmm. He says, this is China. Unfortunately, we don't. Hmm. Um, but he says, what I can do is I can give you a payment plan, right? Hmm. So you, you put 30% up front. I said, I don't even have 30%. He, sa he says, why are you here then? I said, well, I'll figure it out. Don't worry. So I gave him, uh, so he says, I'll tell you what, I'll delay your first payment by 30 days. Hmm. But you have to make a five thousand dollar payment, and which is what I had at the time, right? Okay. So basically, what we did was we went ahead and I built I built a website on Shopify, and and I put up a pre-sale page, sell watches, right? This is the this is 2012, 2013, right? So it was the hmm. heydays of dropshipping. So I said, what? Well, let's try it out, see what happens. Hmm. And long story short, uh, the pre-sale picked up. Facebook ads were cheap. Uh, combination of a few different lucky strokes. Uh, including this man's generosity uh, is how we got started. Um, awesome. And yeah, so that's that's how I got started, man. Uh, a bit of a roller coaster, a bit of like a you know nothing, nothing, nothing's linear, so to mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that I mean the factory that you started working with or the manufacturer um, was it really an exercise of you know the products that they're already making. Um, they're branding it with the name that you came up with and you know you you probably came up with okay i like this style i like this style i, I like this style or was it, or was there um a process where you kind of uh went through a, some sort of a product design process where you said you know your I didn't watch have, is going I to i didn't have time i didn't have time for a product design he says these are oem watches give okay. me a logo i'm gonna slap it on give me your brand i'll slap it on and because that was the that was the way I could keep my costs low. Hmm. And back then it was like three to five dollars. 
just to get a piece out of the door. Today, that same cost is about $15, $20, right? So keep in mind, and these are the OEM pieces. So then it mm. says, look, we're making this for a bunch of different brands. How about I give you, I'll allocate you 100 pieces of each type. Uh, if you can sell them, well and good, you know, otherwise you got to pay up for the cost of these watches. So mm. I said, okay, let's try it out. And the OEM watches resulted in something bigger, which mm. is essentially that we got to then, after we got some cash flow going on, we said, look, we're going to design our own products. We're going to go and design our own type of watches, which was another $20,000, $30,000 bet seven years ago. It's not a $30,000 bet. Now it's probably a $150,000 bet hmm. uh, because prices have risen. Uh, COVID being COVID put everything through the roof. So hmm. there's a few different factors in it. So if everybody thinks like, you know, you need 30 grand, the cost of, I guess, breaching the space is much higher. Hmm. Uh, Facebook ads are expensive at hmm. the same time. Um I mean, I can give you, I can give you a lot of uh, hope, but I can also give you a lot of realism in terms of numbers as to what it would cost today. Yeah, and I mean, I, I definitely want to talk a little bit more about marketing side of things. Um, so you you had a bit of a testing process where you started with the, with those OEM watches, and you kind of tested the market to see, you know, can you run Facebook ads to sell these watches, and can you actually yeah. make money? And then once you had that kind of a market validation, then you, you know, you start started um, have you had your own designs and so forth. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your product selection right now? You know, what kind of watches you have, and what's available to purchase uh, for the consumers right now? Well, yeah, I mean, look, uh, the way the watches are made by by virtue of me being from Vancouver, there's a there's a there's a there's two types of watches, right? There's the Aviator Black, which is the bestseller, right? Um, most of these watches that you see on the site come come with NATO straps and leather straps, right? Yeah. What what the idea behind it was, you know, from from the city to the mountains within, you know, half an hour. Uh, Vancouver is a city that's nestled in the mountains. Uh, so most of my friends who, who, who are from Vancouver and who've grown up there, they love to go skiing or snowboarding, right? So... Every time it rains or, you know, or it's summer, people out on the mountains, they're hiking, they're boating, they're doing all these kind of things, right? Um, the interesting part is uh, when, when, we, when we looked at these watches and we looked at the brand, I think the first, the first logo that we had, for example, was Twin Peaks because the cityscape of Vancouver, whenever you look at it, there were the, the two peaks uh, that you look at it, it's, uh, Grouse Mountain and, and Cypress, mm. right? And when we sort of first first launched the product, we found out somebody on Kickstarter who's from Vancouver who I didn't even know who had the same who had the same logo. Mm. So imagine us, we're trying to get something out of the door, and then you know we see some some other Kickstarter campaign going on with the same logo, and you're like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. Uh we worked, we worked on this product for maybe three months, and then all of a sudden you have to go back and you know do the redesign because what happens is when you go to the factory, fa the factory is going to charge you by mold. Mm. So they are not; they don't have the product ready, mm. but they will make a mold for you, which is five hundred dollars, and mm. then you'll pay say hundred, two hundred dollars per watch. Mm. Okay. So we by the by then we we were about three thousand dollars deep into this product hole, minus plus the cost of branding, plus the cost of design, plus the cost of everything else. Mm. Um, and you know, so you look, you look at it as, uh, all in all, it's about a six to ten, ten thousand dollar hit, and you're like, holy shit, what do you do? So you have to change, mm. you have to change your strategy a little bit, right? Mm. Uh, and that's when we thought of like, you know, what do, what do we name our watches? What, how do we come up with the with the different names, right? It's it's basically the seafarer or the or, or the aviator. So it's it's dependent on the kind of lifestyle that people want, the outdoorsman, right? Mm. Mm. So something that is more related to people who want to be outdoorsy, people who, you know, believe in challenges, people who believe in, you know, um, kindness. So we then we came up with what is the crux of who brands you is, right? Uh, and then we found out uh, our tagline, which is kindness is timeless, right? Mm -hmm. So to be kind doesn't take much. Uh, mm -hmm. And what we wanted to do was create a community of people who, are, uh, you know, kindness could be something as little as helping a lady across the street, mm -hmm. right? So it's quite quite interesting from that perspective. So when you're trying to build a community, when you're trying to build a brand, when you're trying to give a narrative of who your brand is, what they stand for, what they're supposed to be, it all it all is a culmination of a few different things, right? Uh, so you asked me about the marketing of the brand, if I'm not mistaken, right? Well, I was asking you about uh, 
you know what your uh, your product selection really um and uh, i think i think you kind of answered that so you're you know the, your target market and um but you know how many SKUs do you have right now how, how many kind different kinds of watches about 38, 38. okay okay yeah. and that's really to we don't, give... we don't we don't go more than 38 man i mean it's we tried 100 SKUs at one point in time and it's always the 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 uh, Pareto's law 80 20 principle we usually test out every okay. watch that is launched with our with the audience uh, we we phase out the watches that don't sell. Uh, we phase in about two different models a year. That's it. Okay. No, I think I think that's a pretty good approach. Um, I wanted to ask you about you know you kind of took a very unique approach to entrepreneurship, right? So you decided that you wanted to do something for yourself, and you know you've you settled on a certain idea or a product. You know it's going to be watches. And then you took a one-way ticket to China and you kind of said, okay, let me go and see what I can do. Um, do you kind of uh, recommend that approach to all entrepreneurs uh, you know, or anybody who's starting out now? So let's say, you know, I want to create, create an e-commerce business. I mean, uh, I think it's, it's a good approach, you know, so, you know, some people or some entrepreneurs, it's like they will go Alibaba route, right? Or they'll go contact people through, um to online means because they don't want to go to china and you know do that yeah. thing but you know of course there are there is probably benefit to be to being in the place and talking to people and you know seeing things with your own eyes you know as you said you you got the opportunity to go to the factory to see how these watches are made and things like that so there's definitely a lot of benefit to that um what are the pros and cons like do you um if you were starting the same thing now like would you do the same thing uh what would you recommend to other entrepreneurs i tried the alibaba, alibaba route and i failed it miserably right the thing about the thing about china that you have to be sort of careful with there's a few things right number one is you got to be careful of uh, people who call themselves factories mm -hmm. they are not essentially factories they're trading houses and they pose as factories Hmm. To, to to Westerners or to people who don't know the business. So you will hmm. go in there and you will look at these guys and they're like, yes, sir, we have a big factory. Come look at these pictures. But when you go and inspect the offices, it's literally a trading house hmm. who are reselling the factory, uh, some other factory stock. So they're making about 15, 20% margin in the middle. So hmm. the cost of goods that you have is about another, like tack on a 20%, you know, margin on top of it. Mm. Uh, this does not include QA. QA, you have to pay for extra. This mm. does not include like, you know, all the bits and bobs on top. Mm. So, you know, your your cost is up 20% plus you have to tack on another 20%. So your cost is roughly up about 40, let's say 35 to 40%. Mm. Now, if you were to go and meet some, and, and when you end up in on the ground at a trade show, mm. it's very easy because, you know, you get the educational moment when you, when you meet other people, right? So it's like when you meet other entrepreneurs, You'll meet folks like yourself who are also there who have wild dreams to start a business. Hmm. And some of them are a little bit more, uh, they've been around the block a bit more than you. So they'll tell you some of the things to watch out for, to not watch out for. Hmm. Versus you sitting behind a computer and watching a YouTube video, right? Hmm. Uh, the best experience uh, is always on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think sitting behind a desk, uh, people tend to learn a bit, but they, hmm. don't, they won't learn as much as you know, being there at the epicenter of it. I mean, point in case is why does everybody go to Silicon Valley have a higher chance of succeeding hmm. than say living in Vancouver? Yeah, right. for sure. Um, that's a question I would always, I would always ask. It's, it's essentially by, even you're the, if you're the dumbest person in the room, if you're surrounded by the most intelligent people around you, automatically your level is going to be elevated, right? For sure. Um, what I suggest would I suggest a strategy of mine of burning the boats and going straight straight for the jugular? Probably not. I'm an extreme personality. So please don't do what I did. Uh, I mean, my fallback was, you know, worst case scenario, I'll, I'll probably just take the flight back and go back to my nine to five job, which mm. I didn't have, but I, mm. I would have waited a couple of months to find one. Do you still visit China often? Like, do you still go there to these? Yeah, I was in Hong Kong two months ago, man. Okay. Not even two months. Uh, last month. Okay. <laughs> Hong Kong is not China, man. Don't say that. <laughs> but uh, but isn't isn't it now? Um, I think I thought China has a more stronghold. China has a right here. Hong Kong is still autonomous. Okay. <laughs> yeah. People. Right. People from Hong. 
you know it's just for my love it's, i used to live in hong kong so it's still for me at least like personally it's like i still like to call it the special administrative region okay <laughs> I yeah I know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of controversy around around, around this topic so um so okay so um, in terms of getting your first customers like you got success really through facebook ads or were you doing any ads man that's okay. the one thing i knew when i was at when i was at uh, best buy was how to run ads i need i knew paid media i didn't know anything else mm-hmm. that's what i knew uh my my uh i didn't know how to build a website i didn't know how to do anything else what i did know was how to be resourceful and find people when i needed them to so i made all the mistakes of hiring the wrong developers i made all the mistakes of hiring the wrong people i made all the mistakes of hiring and finding and trusting people too much uh all this stuff i think that's what experience is because i think my first 5 years was making all the bad decisions uh my, my next 5 years was trying to compound and find the right people to to join me in my business and that's and that that takes time to find the right people to come and join you in your business is i i still i'm still working on it mm. um but i think i have a very good team mm. i have an excellent uh management team that that sort of helped me out on it um when you, when you, when you think about marketing like all when you come from a marketing background and you are the ceo of a company or a bunch of companies that are very marketing led here's the issue you tend to micromanage it hmm so you know slowly but surely my, my goal is over the next years to start letting go of these things a little bit hmm. so that i can actually uh, focus on some high level stuff okay. the problem is letting go of, if you're a marketer and you let go of marketing that 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 transition is quite hard okay um one thing that i'm very interested to know about is competition right so watches i think there's no shortage of what of what watches in the market right you know if a chinese company is creating watches you know they can do the same thing for you know 10 50 other people and at at, at every right? yeah they are loyal to the dollar man i mean i'd yeah. be loyal to a dollar too if i were a customer or a businessman sure yeah so and and i know there's like there's no shortage of watches watches brand now even like direct to consumer watches there's um, a shit ton hmm there's a lot yeah so so is does it really come down to um who can better brand who can better their, brand who their... can tell a better story look it depends on what niche you're in if it's mechanical watches uh i think so watches quartz watches still remain like i'm on the low end of the spectrum right i'm a 50 to 80 dollar product hmm. things you look at on instagram you don't need to think twice about uh then comes mechanical right uh, automatic and then mechanical automatics hmm. we have a few brands that do about 3 to 800 dollars right hmm. in that co- that that sweet spot of 3 to 800 dollars is very very competitive hmm. when i say competitive it's like there's a lot of young guys who are out there there's a lot of smart intelligent watchmakers who are out there and they have these crazy ideas right you have these insane ideas of making these amazing watches uh and they go to china right hmm. but here's the deal the same factory that manufactures for x brand will manufacture for y brand will manufacture for z brand hmm. they all know that hmm. but it's 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 a it's an open secret they know hmm. where to go the biggest factories are the ones that provide it that what they can do and that you have to be careful of is how you preserve your watch is not being knocked off hmm. right so people end up making the dials in one place they make the the hands in one place they'll make the case packs in one place and the straps in another and they'll mm. go to a fifth factory to be assembled mm. because chances of people trying to rip off your whole design and selling it selling it on alibaba mm. or aliexpress or taobao mm. 100% mm. so if your brand hits big chances are they'll 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 take it and they'll be like well i see that you're selling for 1000 bucks how about i sell this for 100 bucks Hmm. knock off your brand put my own brand on there and sell it on alibaba it's going to hmm. happen hmm. that's the nature of doing business for sure right if you if you entering the market uh, with the thing that somebody is going to copy my idea then maybe i would i would i would ask you to turn that around right in the sense that it's okay to copy i can give you my playbook but can you reach the the sort of uh, 
velocity I can in sales by telling a better story than you. Hmm. Hmm. You can copy the product. China can yeah. copy anything, as as does India. Hmm. But can you tell the same story? Hmm. Yeah, for sure. So what is the what is the customer journey for your products then? Um, you know, how do you one time you... sale, man? One time sale. But so we need to get as many people through the door for one time sales. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, so that's that's the nature of a product, yes. Okay. But so 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 you your marketing is more of an interruption marketing. So people who are, you know, scrolling through Facebook. Right. You, you're, you're uh, through that creative, you're telling a story, you're, you know, you're portraying your product in a way so that, you know, they click and come to your website and your attempt is, you know, on their first visit. Tell them, you... Not let them go, man. Yeah. A conversion okay. rate's really? About, yeah. Five to eight percent. Yeah. Wow. How, I mean, how, how does that work? Like wh- how, and people buy it on their first visit or are you like trying to capture email addresses we, and market? We, yeah, we have to, but there's different ways, man. Email capture lead capture, quizzes, all this other stuff. Okay. And in what visit would you say does the customer usually make hours. the purchase? Within 24 hours. Within 48 so, hours, Max. We, we don't see any sales after 48 hours. Okay. Do you, yeah. so so you, so you the customer comes, looks at the watches, has, uh, has some interest, Maybe leaves the site and then you follow up with emails or some offers to emails, to help marketing, them opt-in offers, discounts. But I would say five to eight percent conversion is really high. Uh, yeah, so... I mean, look at the end of the day, it's like what do you have to give, right? This is a this is the conversion. I mean, we were sitting at about three to five percent before, hmm. but the only way we can increase it is essentially twofold, right? Number one is offering them a free gift. Hmm. which is scraps or something. So up some okay. offers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, how has the, so you said, you know, initially you you really started with the Facebook ads. Has, has, of course, now I, I think there's so much competition on Facebook also. <laughs> how, how has marketing changed? What is working now? And how has marketing evolved for you uh, over time? Like what is working now and what has become challenging in terms of customer acquisition, um and making that sale well it's pretty simple man the the dtc market grew tenfold 2013 there was not as much competition google google ads cost 10 times the money facebook cpms are 10 times or 20 times the value i mean a a good indicator would be looking at the stock look at the stock price from 10 years ago and look at the stock price today right it's like there's a reason why it's gone up to the way it has uh somewhere along the way ios happened it killed it killed half our business Hmm. um uh that that that's also a very interesting sort of journey um we always worry about the next face you know facebook update because we we've been bitten by it before so so i'm always very concerned and worried and i start getting very nervous when the next one rolls around we've been banned uh suspended on google because of uh some that the, the issue is in this day and age you're platform dependent right yeah and one of the bank, bank companies decides your fate yeah. So you 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 are some somebody's your boss. So unfortunately, yeah. as much as I like to say I'm own boss, I'm not. Yeah. My bosses uh, are Facebook, Apple, Google, Amazon. Mm. Mm. You know. So it's uh it's an interesting it's an interesting uh paradigm. Uh, first party data is extremely important. So when I talked about emails, when I talked about SEO, when I talk about you know uh social media, organic social media, organic social media is big. Till about four years ago, then it got monetized. Um, unfortunately, you know the, the 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 nature of the game has changed a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 so unfortunate that we live in a world where a handful of companies basically um, dominate the market, have have the monopoly, and you know it. You are kind of beholden to them, like you. They can decide your fate in, you know, in one blow. So if YouTube decides, for example, they want to demonetize someone, you know, you're gone. Um, if Google decides, or let's say a payment company decides, you can't accept payments on their platform anymore, PayPal or you know any other, um, you you know you're you're kind of done. You're, like you're in. Uh, That's it, man. End of story. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. Um. I mean, do you do you see that changing somehow with AI? I think uh, there's, I think, I think there's, there's, there's been, I think some companies have made an effort. Google, I think, is always good. 
they will literally, they'll get back to you, but they'll get back to you after two, three weeks. Facebook's good now. I think people understand they need to improve the platforms in order to get customers back, right? But customers also use it for very nefarious purposes, right? Yeah. Where people people will run gambling ads when they're not supposed to, or selling cigarettes to young kids when they're not supposed to. So how yeah. do you then come into a platform and, and question them when you know that other people are using it for for the uh, you know illegitimate businesses, which I don't for think sure. is really good. Yeah. I for think sure. there is there is something to be said. I, I say I've I've been on both sides too. I've yeah. been on both sides. No, so I, I, I think it's, it, yeah. And and it's and they do it for the reason of policy enforcement by governments. Imagine one fine day you get fined, you know, fifty million dollars because somebody has screenshots of you of some random advertiser running gambling ads on Facebook in a country like Thailand, where uh, gambling's not permitted. Yeah. So what happens then? Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. definitely a need for moderation, and I mean, it, it, I mean, they're they're in a tricky business for sure. Um, but I think I think it's good if they are kind of at least getting back to you because I think before it was even difficult to get them to respond to your question. Yeah, now that Facebook, <laughs> Facebook has a live help. Wow, it it actually works. Google's okay. always been good. Facebook, I think, is uh, getting better. Okay, so I mean, you know, the big promise of e-commerce is that you know um it's kind of a passive you know the 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 promises that you know it creates passive income right you don't have to there, be, that's all bullshit. <laughs> so passive income yeah you know people yeah it's like at least it's open 24 7 right anybody can go on your website and make the purchase anytime they yeah want. sure and, i mean that's what people say i mean it's uh it's 9 30 p.m right now for me i've been up since 6 a.m so oh wow! Where, where are you? Are you located? And where are you located right now? I'm in <laughs> I'm in Bangkok right now. Oh wow! Okay, I didn't realize. I thought you were in Vancouver, so I was thinking maybe you're joining really early, <laughs> seven a.m. No, but... no. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, and this is this is you know this is probably I would say the same routine. It's a very boring routine, but it's the same routine probably five six days a week maybe. So hmm. you know. And I'm 10 years into my business. Imagine what I did when I was started. The <laughs> the promise of easy money, of running a passive income store, sounds great. Wait till you get into it. <laughs> so 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 oh, your yeah, base your base is right? now your base is Sorry? now in Thailand because it keeps your operations cost uh, down. Uh, or no, for no, no. I just like living remotely, man. Vancouver is too isolated. Yeah, for sure. And probably expensive. Well, I don't know. I have a few houses there, man. I, it does the, the expensive part doesn't matter. They all, my houses all paid off. I can I can okay. live there if I want to. The winters are the winters are extremely cold mm. and very dark. And I I'm a I'm a guy of the sun. So if I have a remote team and I could choose to live anywhere in the world, why won't I leave, live in Thailand? Or why won't I live in Berlin where I used to live? Or why won't I live in Portugal? Wow. Why would I be beholden to one place? Very nice. No, that that definitely makes sense for sure. Um so, as you were saying a little bit before, you know, when we started, um, yeah. this was kind of the, your project that you started with, but now you have moved more into. So, I mean, the reason I was asking that question is now, to me, it seems like this is kind of on a, you know, uh, autopilot for you. You're you're not spending that much active time because you've created the processes, mm -hmm. you've created the mar marketing processes. Yeah. Maybe you have uh, teams that are kind of, you know, managing all of that. And now you have kind of shifted onto a different project, more of a SaaS kind of a project. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about, you know, how that transition came for you? What made you decide to start another project and, and what is that? And, uh, and you know, what are you doing there right now? Well, complacency is definitely the biggest enemy of, of people, people, you know, who entrepreneurs. Uh, even if we don't want to, somehow we'll, we'll put ourselves on the deep end. And for us, we essentially are launching a company called Truly Office which is an alternative to Microsoft Office. Um, so same same concept as Microsoft Office, uh, Word, Excel sheets, uh, Word sheets and PowerPoint, right? Hmm. Comes with an added uh, benefit of PDF, comes with an added benefit of uh, using, you know, mail and storage and everything else. So it's the exact same pro uh, product. But in terms of what, what, what I thought and what really sort of struck me personally was, in this day and age, you know, I kind of got sick of 
everything that I do being crawled by Google or Facebook or, you know, using Google Docs and all that. And and there's a couple of things that stood out to me really, like quite a lot. Number one is every people say, okay, you know, Google Docs is free. I said, sure, Google Docs is free. But then I started looking into the, the, the terms and conditions of Google Docs or Office 365. Mm-hmm. You are subject to US mass surveillance laws, no matter what you put on your computer. So I'm like, wait a second, this is this is this is utter BS. I'm like, I, I I don't want my documentation to be to be read or to be shared by by the US government. I'm not and I'm not talking about as a tin hatter, right? It's it's it the 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 premise is pretty simple. I said we as humans deserve some sort of privacy. I mean, every day, fifty five uh, what Facebook has fifty five million points of data on you. Google has probably the same. So it's like, at least like when I'm working, when I'm running out my last will and testament, I'd like it to be a little bit private and not being read by a third party, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the second thing was everything, everything uh, you know, using that SaaS model was everything today costs less than a cup of coffee, right? Mm-hmm. So when you start adding up as a business owner, you start looking at subscriptions, you know, you've got probably 100 cups of coffee or 200 cups of coffee, depending on how big your business is lying in front of you. And I'm like, I probably drink a cup of coffee a day, but I don't drink anything more than that. So what am I going to do with 200 cups of coffee? That's about $10,000, right? Mm-hmm. So I firmly believe that you we we are able to deliver something that is extremely basic, like an office productivity tool, and put it in the hands of the customer for about $34. So mm-hmm. Word Sheets and Excel, uh, Word, Word, uh, Word Sheets and PowerPoint for about $34. Bucks. That's mm-hmm. what it should cost. Microsoft is charging $150 bucks for the same product. And I said, it shouldn't be that expensive. It mm. can be cheaper. We'll make it cheaper. And that's what we've done. Right? Okay. Uh, the beta is out uh, as of now. And what we're working towards and, you know, having a sprint towards essentially trying to scale up to, to for a release sometime in mid, mid-October. Um, the idea is quite simple. You know, it's it's geared towards digital nomads. It's geared towards freelancers. It's geared towards small businesses. Uh, for, for the difference of what, you know, 34 bucks uh that compared to Microsoft I think it saves you what about a hundred and you know hundred odd dollars hundred and fifteen dollars mm. roughly hundred and fifteen dollars you probably could go out right mm. on a nice dinner and you know thank truly office the next time you know you you get to enjoy something or you spend hundred bucks on yourself for a shave or for shoes or whatever the hell you want mm. you don't or have an experience right you don't need to you don't need to spend an arm and a leg to be productive yeah i mean or or or, or uh, have your data stolen or read yeah yeah i mean it's it's so interesting that all these software companies that that used to provide software on a you know one time cost basis like even i'm thinking about all these adobe software like photo photoshop oh. and all these they're all subscription based now like you have to pay a, an has stock value yeah and and it's it's truly uh, for me it's a it's a deterrent because I mean I have to do let's say one thing or two things uh, you know in two months um, why why am I paying monthly fees or an annual fees for that so yeah that, there's definitely I it's definitely simple, see a need for that yeah it's it, look people who it's like renting a house is buying a house right people love to buy it why would you want to rent anything and my my two cents on the situation is quite simple. I just want to give you a simple straightforward path on how to how to buy this product. See you later. You know, if you if you need me down the road when the next version comes out, I'd I'd really appreciate your business. But for two years, you know, catch you later. Just have fun. Do whatever you want. I'm not gonna be knocking on your door with like all these other things. I'll probably just be educating you on how to protect your privacy. Hmm. The 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 premise is it's your data and you have the you have the right to own your own data. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people are very loosely thinking about, right? Uh, basically, if I were to take somebody like my my dad or some my dad actually pretty decent at it, but like a let's say a person who's not very well educated, imagine yourself walking naked down the street because ha, all your data has been stolen. Like this is the kind of people that scammers go after, right? And the education of customers around their data center privacy is extremely important, and not a lot of people are able to do that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a it's a really great idea. I mean, I am thinking to have to create a SaaS company or a software products uh, and com- 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 a competitor to Microsoft Office. Um, 
I would have thought it would require a, a huge amount of team, you know, large team, huge amount of work and so forth. But um, are you are you are you kind of leveraging some of the open source um, office technologies and kind of building your product on top of that, or or is it like completely no, we acquired built from scratch? Or you acquired a company? We acquired two companies. Okay. This is where you take your ill-gotten gains from from uh, from selling watches. Now I ha you know now you have some money, right? So you take him, you know, you you take the money and you invest it into something which is going to get you bigger. Okay. Right. All right. Makes sense. Um, can you talk a little bit about your uh, fulfillment uh, and and markets you're selling? I mean, to me, it seems like you're kind of working globally. Are you are your watches available to be purchased uh, all over the world, or it's mostly your market is North America? Eighty percent of my revenue is in North America, unfortunately. Okay. We tried to expand in different countries, including India. Uh, we got gamed very well in India and Brazil, which is basically because we have a two-year warranty period. We Same customer sent us back like 20, 30 watches. I was like, nah, man, I'm good, thanks. Okay. So the cost of servicing the customer is quite, quite high, hmm. right? So we said, we're going to focus on countries such as Australia, UK, Canada, US, where the cost of serving the customer is lower, there's less returns. And, you know, that's, that's, that's where we... We, we tend to do well and we said, okay, let's just focus on that and nothing else. So in terms of your warehousing and logistics, are you uh, relying on a third party uh, logis Tripia. logistics? Everything. Tripia. Tripia. Yeah. Okay. The more you can outsource your troubles and start trying to manage it yourself, just do it, man. It's yeah. going to cost you an extra 10%, but it's not worth the headaches. For sure. And are yeah. you... are 10%, you 10 percent saved, but like people, people like when I started, I used to be like, it's 10% saved. Now I'm like, it's 10% well spent. Because yeah. you can sleep at night and the stresses of it are quite different. Yeah, I think that I think that makes complete sense. Are you also on Amazon, or that is not something that uh... we are on Amazon? Yes, 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 we are. Uh, we have to try again. To be honest, the issue the issue with Amazon is quite simple. Uh, Amazon uh, will not insure gift uh, jewelry or, or watches. So the warranty period of Amazon for watches is two years. So at any point in time within the two-year period, anything happens to your watch, it's a refund, it hits your Amazon rating, blah, 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 blah. So we just want to be extremely careful with that. So we were on Amazon. We got ourselves out because Amazon takes 40 cents on the dollar as well. Hmm. Uh, well. Anything. 40 cents to the dollar is cheap, hmm. right? Most people will spend about 50 cents. So you need serious margins to be able to do business on Amazon uh, because you have Amazon ads, 3PL, blah, blah, blah. Different story, right? For sure. Um, what does, do you have a future vision for your business, for this watch business or your vision really is? Selling it off. Uh, as, hmm? Selling it off. Really? Because um, I thought, you know, this, this, this business kind of, you know, is probably a consistent cash flow for you or do you, are yeah, you seeing? I mean, I could, it's consistent cash flow. It's good, but I'd rather sell it off and, you know, take the money and reinvest it into this new company. Okay. Running, it sounds very easy to say, you know, it's a cash cow and then, you know, you want to re keep it going. But trust me, running about three companies at the same time is not easy. <laughs> not everybody's in Elon Musk. For sure. <laughs> yeah. um, in try, every try and run three companies and try and juggle three priorities at the same time. Impossible. Yeah. You'll burn out, man. I burnt out. Like I burnt out like thrice in the last like six months. Yeah. In every entrepreneur's journey, there's always mistakes made, lessons learned, failures. Um, I'm sure, you know, uh, you have quite a few of them. Um, can you share, a, you know, one or two big experiences, learning experiences where, you know, um, you you made a mistake or, you know, you had a failure that you, you know, now you think, you know, you could have done without. And what was the lesson that you learned and what can other entrepreneurs learn from your mistakes? Oh, there's a few, man. I've made more than a few mistakes. I think number one was probably uh, not delegating quickly, mm. uh, which I still have. You know, as I've told you before, I still have sometimes issues with that. I think I should have, should be better delegating. I think it makes more sense. Uh, communications. Uh, sometimes I expect people to read my mind. Uh, my mm. teams, now that they've worked with me for a while, they kind of understand it, but I can be a better communicator for sure. Mm. Like 100%. Right. If your communication isn't clear, if you're not 
replaying that narrative of why we're here, what we're doing, what is what that we want to achieve in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Chances are those people around you are not going to believe in it if you yourself don't believe in it. Hmm. It's the it's the vision, it's hmm. a repetition, it's hammering it in again and again. That's how you create a culture. Definitely. Yeah. Now we're going to move on to our rapid fire segment. In this segment, I'm going to ask you a few quick questions and you have to answer them maybe in a couple of words or a sentence or so. Sure. First, the first one is, um, I don't know if you read a lot of books, one book recommendation for entrepreneurs. Um, and Billion why. Dollar Whale. Billion Dollar Whale. Billion Dollar Whale. It's called okay. the Billion Dollar Whale. And why? What's the message there? I don't know. I, I, I It's... For me, it's it's away from entrepreneurship. It's about the guy who took the one MDB fund in Malaysia for $13 billion. It's pretty interesting. It's how cash exchanges hands, money launders exchange hands all around the world. Okay. It's interesting. An innovative product or idea in the current e-commerce, retail, or tech landscape that you feel excited about? Ooh. Can I say pass? Sure, sure. A business or... office. Very, Truly. very exciting. Okay. <laughs> Um, I guess the next one can be truly office also, but uh, I'll ask you anyways. A business or productivity tool or software that you would recommend or a productivity tip? 100% truly office. Wow, what a great software. <laughs> Can't go wrong with it, man. But uh, a- Any productivity office, tip? Uh, I mean, given that you're running three companies? Productivity tip, hire an assistant. Okay. Best decision ever made. A remote assistant or? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, a startup or business in e-commerce, retail, or tech that you think is currently doing great things, besides yours, of course. No, I don't think so. I'm doing great things. I'm even launched yet, man. What are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> who is doing a good job? Miro. I heard. I heard a really. I read this really good article about Miro that scaled from three million to sixty million users post COVID, and I'm like, holy shit! Yeah. They must have done something right. Uh, another one that I always love and I admire is Basecamp. Basecamp, okay. Yeah. Cool. A peer entrepreneur or business person whom you look up to or someone who inspires you? I don't know. My mom. I, I'm, I'm no word of a lie, man. She's, 60, she's 63. She does like, she works seven days a week. Hmm. Uh, she runs two businesses and does a full-time job. Whoa. She's a counselor. Yeah. She's 63, man. Yeah. No, I can't. Yeah, I can't, I can't complain about my life if, if that lady at 63 is doing this. So. Awesome. Um, final question. One, uh, what is the best business advice that you have ever received or you would give to other entrepreneurs? Not an advice giver, but I can tell you the one I received. Okay. What was pay for the convenience of it. Right? If you can hire somebody uh, to the job for less than what your hourly rate is. Find mm-hmm. out what your hourly rate is first. If you find somebody to like delegate that to somebody else for less than what you you know what your hourly rate is, you'll be very happy in life. I sincerely believe in that. Outsource your problems. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's a great advice. I think that is an advice that every entrepreneur either intuitively understands or you know if anybody is in the entrepreneurship business they 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 come to a realization at one point or another like you can do everything on your own and you have to you have to be willing to let go so that's that's definitely one of the best advices well ronnie those were all the questions that i had really interesting talking to you thank you for sharing your story for sharing some really great um stories and and business insights and you know some of the things that you've done in your own business and you know how you're moving um if anybody wants to get in touch with you or want to purchase your watches what is the best way they can do that just reach out to me on linkedin ronnie teja or just go to brandj.com buy a watch make me happy i appreciate it awesome well thank you so much again ronnie and uh, wish you all the very best in your uh, business and personal life as well so thanks again for joining me today at trip talks Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Awesome. Bye.